Welcome to our review on the leaf and photosynthesis. What we've actually got here then first of all are two diagrams you need to be familiar with. On the left we've got the main structures that you'll see from looking at the actual surface of our leaf. So you've got the stalk, the veins, the midrib and the leaf blade. And then on the right, the one that's far more important as far as I'm concerned, the internal structure of the leaf. So what we can see on there is at the very, very top, we've got this cuticle, which is a waxy cuticle that basically is to do with waterproofing. Next bit down is the upper epidermis, which is a transparent layer. Then we come onto this sort of vertical section, if you like, which are the palisade mesophyll cells. And you can see there are lots of chloroplasts present in those, which are the little green blobs. The next section down is the spongy mesophyll layer, which has this big space in there, which is an air space, which is very important for the movement of gases. And then in our lower epidermis at the bottom, you can see there is this structure in the middle called our stoma or the stomata. And on each side of the stoma, you've got these specialized cells called guard cells. We need to consider the adaptations that the plant's leaves actually have to allow them to carry out photosynthesis. So the first one is that they tend to be quite broad and flat. And the reason behind this is that it gives them a large surface area to allow them to absorb more light. And as we know, light is needed in photosynthesis. We will also find that the leaves tend to be very thin. Now the whole purpose of that is to make sure there's only a very short diffusion pathway, so a short distance for the gases to move, for our carbon dioxide. Because remember, our plant needs to take in carbon dioxide from the air, going through those stomata, and reach those palisade cells, particularly for photosynthesis. We will also find that our cells inside our leaf contain this chlorophyll and other pigments. It's not just one pigment inside our chloroplasts, but it has the chlorophyll, which we know, and several others. The purpose behind that being to absorb as much energy from different parts of the spectrum as we can. We'll also find those palisade cells are packed very neatly in rows in order to maximize the space. We will have these veins that run throughout the leaf, as we saw in that first diagram, that contain these structures called vascular bundles. Now, they have a couple of purposes, first one being to support the leaf, and the second one is to transport substances to and from the different cells. Finally, they've got lots of stomata on that underside, which are to allow the gas exchange, and those stomata are actually controlled by the guard cells found on either side. We also find that inside the upper palisade layer, we've got the greatest amount of chloroplasts. The reason behind that being that it's closest to the surface that faces the light. So having more chloroplasts in those cells means that we're going to trap more of that sunlight energy. In that spongy mesophyll layer, we've got those air spaces, as we mentioned. Now, the purpose behind that is to make it easier for that carbon dioxide to diffuse from the stomata to the palisade cells where it's needed in photosynthesis. The reason they do that is because they've got this large surface area to volume ratio which means we can absorb large amounts of gases in a short space of time. We'll also have that upper epidermis being transparent because obviously it's got to allow the light to reach the palisade cells. In B4, we need to know about one group of scientists and those are the ones associated with developing the idea of photosynthesis. So if we go way, way back, we go to the ancient Greeks first of all. Now, the way the ancient Greeks worked was they sat around a lot looking at things and coming up with ideas. So they liked to think about things. And what the ancient Greeks did was they were sitting around stroking their beards as all the ancient Greeks did. And they came up with this idea that plants grew by absorbing minerals from the soil. Because they saw plants, they were in the soil, they figured, okay, they grow by absorbing minerals from it. But it was merely thinking about it. They didn't do any experiments at all to test this. Then we have to come many, many years into the future, to the 1600s now, where we encounter our next scientist, which is Jean-Baptiste Van Helmont. Now, he actually did an experiment that was relatively important in this discovery of photosynthesis. He actually had these willow trees, which he grew in little pots. Now, what he did at the very start of the experiment was he weighed the willow tree, he weighed the pot and the soil, and then he only added water to them. What he then did later on was he then re-recorded the mass of the willow tree and the mass of just the pot and the soil 
and what he worked out was that the willow tree had increased by a significant amount in its mass by 74 kilograms but the soil hadn't really seen any major changes so his theory then was that plants grow by absorbing water as that was the only thing he'd added to it then jump forward another hundred and a bit years and we come to 1771 and joseph Priestley. what he actually did was carried out another experiment with mint plants and mice now what he had was a chamber with mice in it completely sealed and no surprise the mice died because obviously they ran out of oxygen then he worked out that if you put mint plants into that chamber again with the mice and seal it all up then the mice would survive that little bit longer because the plants produced oxygen for them so his idea then was that plants produced oxygen because the mice he put in there with them survived longer than the ones that were just in a sealed chamber with no plants the last experiment we need to understand in terms of the development of our ideas on photosynthesis is the one that involves the use of isotopes and hopefully we remember from our chemistry that an isotope is a form of an element with a different number of neutrons present and what we've actually done is by carrying out experiments using different isotopes we've proved that the oxygen released by plants as a result of photosynthesis comes from the water and not the carbon dioxide so that's actually given us that proof that the oxygen our plants release that originally came from the water they took in and not the carbon dioxide